Today we're going to talk about one of the most exciting aspects of the Christian life, and that is healing of the body. We need to start with the Bible. What does the Bible say about God healing the body? I've prayed for lots of people to get healed, and why aren't people getting healed today? More than anything else, we want to tell our stories. That the Lord saw this mystery, this medical mystery inside my body, and saw me and saw what I was dealing with and wanted to heal me radically changed how I view the Lord. But still, he never gave up on me, and you know, he, he delivered me from this, from this affliction, and it was, it's wonderful. You don't have to think you can only be healed one time. Like, God is okay with us asking more than once. So I didn't miss out a lot on life. I don't have to anymore. You brought life back. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Hey, my name is Pastor Tyler Warner. I'm the pastor of Calvary Chapel in Trussville, Alabama. And today we're going to talk about one of the most exciting aspects of the Christian life, and that is healing of the body. Now, as soon as I say that, some of us have reactions to that statement of healing of the body and the Christian life. As at best, sometimes we think that healing is something that certain Christians get to experience, special Christians at special times or out on the mission field or maybe for specific people God has called. And there might even be others that think there is no place for healing in the Christian life, that this is something God is done with. It's not fair to give people false hope. There's often a lot of pain. There's a lot of theology tied up into that and a commitment to the Lord, honest commitment to the Lord that can hinder this, this understanding. But then you got other folks that say, hey, healing basically is the gospel. And if we're not seeing healing, if you're not seeing healing, there's something wrong with you, friend. And that this can be a preoccupation with the church to the exclusion of Jesus Christ, which should never be the case. Because even when Jesus healed people, all the glory always went to God the Father. And that should always be the case, no matter what. So, we're going to spend some time talking about the theology surrounding this, more or less answering some questions that folks have, but more than anything else, we want to tell our stories because God has blessed Calvary Chapel Trustville in a special way where he has reached out many times his healing hand to miraculously and medically heal bodies in this very room or in other rooms that we've been praying in where God says, I'm going to heal in answer to the prayer of faith. I am not special. Our church is not special, they're special to me, and they're special to the Lord, but not, not like that, you know what I mean? There's no special endowment that I believe is inaccessible to anybody else. Everything that I'm going to talk about today are things that we've gleaned from scripture and just from being sound in our common sense before the Lord. As we talk about healing, I realize there's a lot of preconceptions. Let's just think through these things biblically and let's listen to the testimony that we might be encouraged together. So as with anything, when it comes to the matters of the Spirit, we need to start with the Bible. What does the Bible say about God healing the body? The first obvious thing is that sickness and pain and affliction were not part of God's original design. God created all things with Adam and Eve and said they were good. And it was sin, it was reaching out to take the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that caused thorns and pain and sickness to come into the world. And so that's a very important thing to know because if you believe that this is just the way things are and always have been the way God wanted them, then you're, you're not going to believe that this is something that God would desire. But then as we go through the Bible, you see several times God reaching in with his miraculous hand to heal the body. You think especially in the lives of Elijah and Elisha where they were even bringing people back from the dead and that this was one of the marks of the prophets that there would be healing signs that accompanied them. And all of this builds, of course, as it always does, to Jesus Christ. That when Jesus was going around, he was not just a preacher. He was not even just a, a religious figure. He was a healer. That's even something that uh, secular scholars have agreed that the reputation of Jesus at the time was that he was a faith healer, that he could heal people. We see him in the synagogues with the people that had the withered hands or that were bent over. He was healing the blind, which was especially controversial because the, the Pharisees at the time were teaching only the Messiah will open the eyes of the blind. And now here comes Jesus doing that. They've got a problem because they hate Jesus. But the Bible says multiple times, everyone who came to him was healed. In fact, there was so much healing going on in Jesus' ministry that he had at times had to withdraw from that part of his ministry because people didn't want anything to do with his teaching. 
There's a lesson in that. We shouldn't ignore teaching. It's what we're trying to do right now is to bring these two together. But when Jesus sent out his disciples, he said, I'm sending you out with the same authority that I have. And he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, preach the gospel to the poor. When Jesus sent out the 12 and eventually the 70 to go and preach in the land while he was still alive, part of their ministry was healing. It was a testimony to the fact that God is here and the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, when Jesus, of course, died on the cross and rose from the dead, hallelujah, he said, I'm about to send you all out again. And this time he said, I'm going to fill you with the same Holy Spirit that empowered me while I was alive. And that is so key because Jesus didn't do any ministry until he was filled with the Holy Spirit. There were no secret miracles Jesus was doing at his 16th birthday party. It was when he was baptized at the Jordan River by John that the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove, drove him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and then he came back preaching and healing. So in the same way, Jesus told the apostles, don't leave Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost when the tongues of fire came upon them and the mighty rushing wind. It's an exciting story. And the very next story we see in the book of Acts is a healing. Peter and John are going to the gate, beautiful, to enter the temple. And there's a beggar, there's a lame man there. And Peter very famously says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, let's walk. And he lifts him up and there's a massive revival and people are getting healed and they're getting saved. And this is just the recurring theme of the book of Acts. Where the dispute comes in is, does this continue? The, the allegation that's put out there is that during the time of the apostles in the book of Acts, that was a unique time period in church history where God was using these miraculous signs to authenticate the gospel message. So far, so good. But what then will be said is, once the church had been established, there was no need for healing. And so healing began to die out. A couple problems there. First of all, and the most glaringly obvious one is, there is no place in the Bible that says that. That is an entire conclusion drawn from outside of Scripture because the only thing the Bible tells us to do is to continue to seek the Lord. James tells us to anoint with oil and to bring before the elders those who are sick. Paul refers in Galatians and other places about God doing miraculous signs and wonders among them. That these were common things that took place. They were still wonderful and miraculous, but these were to be continued. In fact, in Acts 2.39, when Peter was talking about the gospel, he says, this message is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And that included the gift and the blessing of the Holy Spirit, which was manifested through healing, among other things. The other thing that I think is important to mention is there are references to miracles throughout church history. The problem is, many times we lump those into a box of, well, those are just ancient people, or those were just Catholics, and so those miracles don't count. When in reality, there are many times throughout church history, especially during times of revival, where the healing ministry would ramp up again. It certainly seems to be one of those gifts that God pours out in certain times in greater measure than at others. But I, I deny the, the premise of that, that miracles stopped and healing stopped during church history. We've even got men like St. Anthony, who was one of the first monks in the desert. And I don't like talking about desert monks, but I've read his story. He was a faithful man of God, and the Lord used him to do all sorts of mighty wonders through the Holy Spirit. And this has just continued down through our time. And so now it's all the way come down to our little church here, and the Lord is blessing it in an amazing way. So what does the Bible say? The Bible says, ask and you will receive. Jesus said, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, won't your heavenly Father give good gifts to you? And if the work of the Holy Spirit is still active today, then we should expect that the kinds of things that were happening then will continue. The ending of Mark, Jesus said, these signs will accompany those that follow after me. And one of the things he lists is they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. It's in the book of Acts, it's in church history, and it's in our testimonies here too. Now we hear this and one of the immediate responses is, well, I've prayed for lots of people to get healed, and why aren't people getting healed today? Usually there's a personal story behind that, but often it's like, well, what about, you don't see lots and lots of people getting healed today, it simply doesn't happen. Again, I'm going to disagree with you. I travel a little bit to preach, and one of the things I like to do, there's a message that I give where I'll ask this question. I'll say to the congregations, if you or someone you can verify personally has been miraculously healed by the Lord, will you raise your hand? So I'll ask you that question too, if you're watching this. Have you or someone you can verify personally, have they been healed? 
I'm not afraid to ask that question anymore. First time I was shaking in my boots because I'm like, what if nobody raises their hand, right? But now it's just like every time, everybody raises their hand. And I tell people to look around and say, God is still healing today. So we do need to remember this. There are lots of people being healed. They might not be in the churches that you attend, but you've probably got at least one of those stories in your life. And sometimes you think, oh, that was just that special thing that God gave me to treasure up in my heart. I would disagree with that. It's your job to testify and tell other people of what God has done for you so that they can believe that God can do it for them too. Jesus said one time with the man that was lowered down through the roof, remember? He didn't say, be healed. He said, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees were very upset by that. And Jesus said, here's how you know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Take up your bed and walk. These things go together. So these things are still happening in great measure, especially places out on the mission field. Why out on the mission field? Well. There is a part of it we need to admit that the Bible says that according to your faith, it will be unto you. And I know there are some people who have really beat up the church in this respect. And they say, if you've not been healed, it's because you don't have enough faith and it's all your fault. What a horrible thing to say to somebody whose mother is dying of cancer, for example, or whose little kid has some affliction that they can't get over. But we can't ignore the fact that that is still in Scripture. James talks about the double-minded man not receiving anything from the Lord. Jesus, when he went to Capernaum or when he went to Nazareth to his hometown, he says he could do no mighty work there because they did not believe. So is that saying Jesus was limited in his power? No, it seems to be that when God heals somebody, faith is part of it. You've also got that story of the man whose son was an epileptic and had a demon. Jesus said, do you believe I can heal? And he said, uh, well, Lord, if you can. And Jesus said, what are you talking about? If I can. And the man said, I believe, but help my unbelief. And Jesus said, that's good enough for me. So faith does factor into it. And I think when you go out on the mission field, people who are already predisposed to believe in the supernatural, believing in healing is not nearly as complicated for them as believing in God in the first place as it is in our, our country, in our culture. I also believe that when you're on the front lines of the gospel and you're doing a lot of evangelism work, you're going to see more of these things happen. But I will say that the more we have prayed about these things and taught about these things and sought the Lord for these things in our church, these things have begun to happen regularly. So maybe if more of us were more open and willing to pursue these things, we might see more of them. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 has a very famous passage where he talks about how he had a thorn in the flesh, some kind of affliction of the body to keep him humble. And he prayed three times for God to heal that thorn in the flesh. And God said, no, no, my grace is sufficient for you. And that's a great passage because it reminds us that not everybody is going to be healed. There are times where the Lord says, no, I have a different plan. And so Paul says, fine, I'm just going to be happy that I'm saved. And that's a good lesson to teach. But I think that sometimes we get to that point too soon. We say, well, I just think God wants to teach me something through this. Well, are you sure? Are you sure that you haven't just given up hope? That you haven't been praying anymore? You're tired of the struggle of prayer, which prayer is a labor to struggle through sometimes. Now, you see in that story that Paul was willing to accept God's grace, but what was Paul's expectation? His expectation was that God would heal him. That's why he kept coming back. And that's not evidence that Paul's power was diminishing. Paul had no power. It was God's power. It was the Holy Spirit's power. He had no more power in the Spirit than I do if I'll be submitted to the Holy Spirit or you will. So there are those that God sovereignly decides not to heal, but we should look at what Jesus told us to do. And in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells the story of the persistent widow. Do you remember this one? Where the widow was coming to the judge who was corrupt and wasn't going to give her justice. But finally he says, fine, lady, take whatever you want. Because he says, she's going to keep bothering me if she keeps coming. When Jesus said, so how much more will your heavenly father listen to you when you cry out to him? And then Jesus said, but when I come, will I find faith on the earth? Jesus knew this would be hard for us to believe. We also forget that there's a spiritual battle going on in here. That this is a struggle between heaven and earth. It's a struggle between the people of God and the angels of God and those that are serving the, the devil, serving the king of this world. And this is a battle we're engaged in. And we shouldn't treat it like magic. That if I either pray and it doesn't happen or, you know, then there's no such thing as prayer. Well, that's not how it works, my friends. God is a person. God is persons. And when we're praying, we're calling out to him and asking for his help. And when you do that, God says, I will help you. I will do this. There's even a passage in the Gospels where it connects Jesus' healing ministry and it says this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the prophet Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed. 
There is a passage in the New Testament that connects Jesus' work on the cross to the healing work he does in the body. Now, there are some that push that way too far, but there it is. It's there in the scripture. So do we believe that God heals today? Yes, we do. The Bible says that he does. Does he heal everybody? No, he doesn't. And we don't always know the reason for that. Sometimes it's sin. Sometimes it's a lack of faith. Sometimes it's just not the time. And sometimes you've got to keep on asking because the answer is coming. The answer is on its way. And now a third thing I might throw out there is, what about all the weird people that do healing ministry? There are a few of those. There are a lot of those actually. And you might ask the question, okay, a lot of these ministries are clearly legitimate. Like these people are seriously being healed, but this guy's a Fruit Loop, <laughs> this guy's a weirdo. Or these people that their doctrine is wrong or their practice is wrong and they're taking the money and there's all sorts of scandal associated with it. And yet you can't deny people are being healed in this ministry. I think you can look at this a couple ways, but here's the main one. God is so gracious and God is so kind that even when somebody is coming about it all wrong, he will honor his name and he will honor the faith of hurt and suffering people. I also think we need to remember that if you're gonna be asking for healing in 2024, you're gonna be praying for somebody to be healed, you need to have a, a certain level of, I don't care what people think about me. Because if you're going to be so worried about what, what people are going to think, and sometimes we pray like this, right? We, we pray in such a way that there's no possible way God could say no because we covered all of our bases and therefore God is safe and protected. We don't have to worry about him being embarrassed. But that's not the prayer of faith. That's a prayer of doubt really more than anything else. But somebody that already doesn't care what people think about them, somebody who's going to have really weird hair and run around yelling and do that kind of stuff, that kind of person already doesn't care. So if they love Jesus, they're already predisposed to be willing to ask for prayer. Be like, you mean the Bible says we can pray and God heals us? Well, let's pray right now. And we all can learn something from that. Now, the people that are seeing the moves of the Spirit of God, they may be soft on their doctrine, but boy, they are strong in their faith. And we need to make sure that we are not so strong in our doctrine that we get weak in our faith. And in fact, if our doctrine is causing us to have less faith, then maybe there's some bad seeds being planted there. But more than anything else, I'm not really interested in what somebody else is doing. I'm interested in what the Bible says. And I'm interested in what God, the Holy Spirit, wants to do in my life and in the people that I love and the people that I minister to. And that's what we've seen at Calvary Chapel, is that God is still healing today and he's healing a lot. I have no power, I have no special endowment, but I think I have faith. And I hope this will build that faith in you too as we listen to some of these stories. I had chronic pain in my right shoulder for 15 years from about 2004 through the fall of 2019. And this fall marks the five year anniversary of the Lord healing me from that chronic pain. Psalm 105 verses one through five. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. I believe in a God who heals people. I believe um, in a God who works miracles and I believe that because I've lived it. When I was in the fourth grade is when I remember the initial injury being I was in gym class messing around doing a back bridge and my shoulder gave out from under me and I was in a lot of pain on my right side and my mom took me to the doctor and they did x-rays and checked me out and couldn't find anything worth concern and we went for follow-up appointments and I was still in a lot of pain and the doctor could only attribute it to uh, the one strap backpack that I was wearing at the time. And as time went on, the pain seemed to dull, but it was constant. And I kind of stopped mentioning it to other people because I didn't really have an answer for it. As the years went on, I went into high school and I still had dull pain every day as soon as I woke up until I felt, fell asleep at night. Um, and it worsened <laughs> when I was in high school. I was playing lacrosse and managing the field hockey team and being physically active made my shoulder worse. 
because it was doing things that I wasn't used to doing. Um, when I would injure myself playing lacrosse or roll an ankle or something and I'd go to a doctor, I'd say, by the way, I have pain in my shoulder constantly. Do you have any suggestions for what that may be? This is what happened and here's how it play has played out so far. Do you have any guesses as to what that may be or anything you can recommend? And I did years of physical therapy and in college I pinched a nerve and did a full summer of physical therapy, had a CT scan, nothing, nothing was ever found. Um, when I graduated college, my pain level was decently high, not anything crazy, but higher than any normal human being should have on any given day. Um, but I didn't really tell a lot of people because I was kind of ashamed that I was in pain. And I had, I think, a lot of pride that I didn't want people to know what was going on with me. Um, or feel bad for me in a way. A few months after I moved to Alabama, when we moved into our new church space, Tyler announced he wanted to have a night of prayer specifically for healing. I had never at any of the prayer nights I had ever been to at Calvary Chapel Lynchburg when I attended there, never mentioned um, that I needed healing because I didn't think I needed healing. I had been to the doctors, they couldn't diagnose me and if you can't be diagnosed, how can I be healed from it? How do I ask for prayer for something that doesn't have a name? Um, so I was planning to come to the prayer night and I hadn't really thought like normal about asking for healing. And I think it was a lack of faith that the Lord could heal me. Um, but that night, I specifically remember as I was driving to church, I was in some of the worst pain of my life. Um, I had, had broken bones and it was on comparable levels of pain to that. Um, and it was in both of my shoulders that night. And it felt, I, I can only really describe it. It felt like someone had a sword down through my spine behind my shoulder, my shoulder blade and was just turning it around and I could feel it twisting behind my shoulder blade. And I, I got to church, I couldn't focus. And as we turned to prayer, I, I knew I couldn't live like this anymore. And when Tyler asked if anyone needed healing, I shot my hand up. I said, I can't, can't live like this anymore. I'm constantly in pain and I don't talk about it because I don't know what to do about it, but I, I need the Lord to heal me. And so everyone gathered around and they laid their hands on me. As they prayed for me, it felt like a, a weight was lifted off my shoulders and all of the pain in my left shoulder, which was normally my good shoulder, was gone. I still had a dull ache in my right shoulder, but at that point for me, it, I was in relief, more relief than I had felt in years. We went about the rest of the prayer night and I went up to Pastor Tyler and Zach after, and I was like, hey, this is amazing. All of the pain in my left shoulder is gone. I still have a little bit in my right, but I, I'm feeling good. And they were like, nope, not good enough. We gotta keep praying. So they began to put their hands on me. Tyler anointed me with oil. And they asked specifically, okay, where is the worst of the pain? Is it here? And they would put their hands on me and they would pray. And I remember every time Tyler put his hand on me, it felt like he was touching me with like a burning stove plate. His hand was so hot every time. And I, I don't know why, but that specifically sticks out to me. And they would pray and the pain would move in my shoulder to a different part along my neck, along my spine, but in that same shoulder region. And they were like, okay, it moved, let's pray again. Okay, it moved, let's pray again. And after four or five times, it was gone. No more pain. And I started crying and um, they explained to the room, the people who were still hanging around after service that I was healed and we all rejoiced together. Tyler t looked at me and he says, I, I want to show you something. And he takes out his phone and he pulls up a note of a vision he had that morning. And he wrote it down in the notes app of his iPhone. And he had a vision of something moving around in someone's upper back and shoulder between their neck and the base of their spine. And in that moment, I felt so seen by the Lord. Um, in the Bible, they call him Elroy, um, specifically Hagar. 
as the God who sees me, feeling so known that the Lord saw this mystery, this medical mystery inside my body and saw me and saw what I was dealing with and wanted to heal me, um, radically changed how I view the Lord. And since then, remembering that the Lord sees me, the Lord loves me, <laughs> he healed me, um, it's, it's such a relief. Like there's so much peace and joy that comes with that, being known by the one who made you. Um, it, I don't have enough words to describe it. The Lord's just been so good to me. <laughs> so the first person to be healed at Calvary Chapel was Emily. And we had been praying for a long time because we believed that the Lord could heal. We knew the testimonies, but we we're saying, Lord, we want to see somebody healed in this room right now. And that night before I was preparing for the service to come out, I believe it was during our week of prayer, uh, I was just writing things down on my phone and saying, I, I, Lord, what about this? Just thoughts that I have. And the Lord put this thought in my heart that pray for somebody whose back needs to be healed. I said, okay. And then there was other thought that came in uh, moving. I was like, that doesn't make any sense, moving. But I said, all right, I'm just going to write that down because it's from the Lord. And as we laid hands on Emily and began to pray for her, she said, okay, I, I, it doesn't hurt there anymore, but the pain has moved over, over here. And so we prayed again, and now it's moved over there. And so I knew, okay, this is from the Lord. And so I showed her the same thing. I said, this is what God said to pray for, so we're going to stay here and pray until you feel 100% better. And we did, and we prayed, and, and as she said, she was healed in that, that moment. And I stood up, I was jumping up and down, hey, everybody, look over here, Emily's doing great. And it was, it was so amazing. And you'd think it'd feel like that all the time. You, it's amazing what you can get used to, but that was an example of the Lord giving me a word of knowledge ahead of time, that this is somebody you need to pray for. And I try my best to listen to those things now, because sometimes, yeah, it might just be a thought that I have, but sometimes it could be the Holy Spirit of God giving you a heads up, and you gotta pay attention to those things. The Lord has healed me from a demonic spirit of affliction. And this was back in 2022. Well, really, the story started in 2021 uh, with demonic nightmares that I was having. And the, the image that I remember seeing in my mind was I was under underground looking down into the pit, uh, as it were, and... Uh, monstrous creature came out of the pit and in a very guttural sort of raspy kind of voice outright said that I'm going to get you and it was three or so weeks later after that into the new year that the first symptoms of the affliction started to show which ultimately amounted to exhaustion and brain fog and just an inability to function in most areas of day-to-day -day life. Um, certainly wasn't able to enjoy hardly much of anything in the day-to-day -day life. Uh, even getting to the point where I would leave, you know, the game nights uh, with, the, with my friends early because I just couldn't maintain it anymore. I couldn't stay awake, I couldn't focus, I just was miserable, you know, it was, pain just all over my body, fully on head to toe, and just was something that no matter what kind of over-the-counter medication or doctor-prescribed medication or this theory or that theory or whatever it was, and it's just nothing worked. And there was no, and no end in sight. You know, even after getting a CT scan done, there was a brief moment where one of my doctors uh, believe that I might have had multiple sclerosis, which was also uh, a shock that I didn't quite fully comprehend when it was first told to me, but within maybe the next 10 minutes or so, it, it landed pretty succinctly what it was. And so it was, it was something that there was going to be no other deliverance but the Lord. There was going to be no way out except for the Lord getting me out of it. That was really brought on just by a long run of untreated, unrepented sin is really the short version of how did I become susceptible to 
a demonic spirit in the first place is just sin that just stacked up and stacked up and stacked up. And instead of having a short account with God, I had a rather long one. And that's how I got squarely put in the enemy's backyard, so to speak. And it came to the point where we had a week of prayer at our church. It was the week before Easter. And on the, our, the last night of the prayer week on a Thursday, I remember I was the last person to get prayed for that night. Uh, and I had to get prayed for twice. You know, the first round was exactly as scripture ordains. You know, the congregation lays hands on me. I'm anointed with oil and I'm prayed for, for the healing of my sickness and the forgiveness of my sins there. And the pain didn't go away. The pain moved. Uh, and that was the first telltale sign that we knew it wasn't just any ordinary mundane sickness. It was something spiritual, something supernatural. And and so our pastor and one other brother uh, took me aside afterwards and prayed for me again. And the pain where it had moved, instead of being all over my body, it was at four concentrated points. It was at my both of my wrists and both of my ankles. And I almost felt like I had handcuffs or prison manacles that were chaining me down that night. It's you know, like the enemy was saying, no, I'm, I'm not letting you go. You can't get out of this. This is who you are. Well, our pastor, that very day as part of an engagement with prison fellowship at uh, maximum security prison here in the state he led an inmate to christ that day now when we're at the prayer meeting and the pain moves and feels like i have prison manacles around my wrists and my ankles that was further confirmation to all of us that it was not mundane this was a evil spirit that was trying to afflict me and so they went point by point, started with my left wrist and then went to my right wrist, then down to my right ankle and then to the left ankle. And the last point is on my left ankle on the left side of the pointed ball in your ankle was the point where the pain left finally. And it was de dedicated prayer for each spot. And it was like I felt like the, the handcuffs get ripped off or the chains just get broken one by one by one as we were praying for it. And our pastor told me in his mind's eye, he saw uh, this elongated, disgusting looking crab that had a grip on my ankle. And it was this sickly purple color, like when a bruise turns that sickly kind of purple color. And one claw was much, much bigger than the other one. And that's what he saw gripping onto my ankle. And then sure enough, after praying for it, it was just gone. It was gone and the Lord healed me right there in that moment. And, you know, that was relieving. At, f at first, I remember being a little hesitant or cautious, like almost like I was scared to, to believe that I was in fact healed just because over the course of the sickness, it went, it was subsided for a brief time as I was prescribed some antibiotics from the doctors. But once those ran their course, it came roaring back and then nothing worked. So I thought, okay, is, is this another temporal relief or am I, or am I really done? And and it was really done. It was over and gone. And our pastor said to me shortly thereafter that he had a word from the Lord for me. And it was that the Lord had put a claim on my life as part of the, the ordeal of the night. And that has now ultimately culminated in me knowing what my own calling is. And it's, it's going to be service to the Lord. But now, with that testimony in hand, I remember, <laughs> thinking about it now, I remember asking in prayer for a testimony to share, probably about the time, or a little bit before the time, that I had that demonic nightmare before this whole ordeal started. And <laughs> maybe I had a different idea in mind of how the Lord would answer that prayer, but 
he's answered the prayer and was faithful and steadfast through it all. And so now I've got his testimony to share. I remember when we went on our men's retreat, we had a prayer night there. And I was one of the ones that our pastor asked to share the testi- uh, my testimony of healing, as that's precisely what we wound up praying for. I remember there was a young man, maybe early 20s, uh, early to mid-20s at the time, that had cancer. He had a cancerous tumor in his forehead, and it was one of those you could literally put your finger on it and feel the tumor. Well, we all prayed for the healing of the tumor and that it would just go away, that the Lord would remove the cancer from him. And, you know, we followed up with him after the retreat was over. A couple weeks go by. He had his follow-up appointment with his doctor and come to find out, cancer's gone. (laughs) The Lord showed up and took away that that affliction too. Just from sharing of testimonies and praying and laying on hands and anointing with oil and all the rest of it. And now... Uh, I have the opportunity to live out my calling and to attend my first ever missions trip where I'm sure I'll have ample opportunity to share the testimony time and again as we go overseas to a nation where it's there have been there have been some stories as we've we've gone there once already and there's just been mighty works of the Lord from the first time around and I we're going back so clearly the work's not done and there's there's more to do and so the Lord has used this whole ordeal while even though I was in, when I was in the middle of it I had no idea what he was going to do with it or how it was going to pan out or if the pain was ever going to go away the Lord was orchestrating a testimony to share now for the future, but then also saw use that as a chance to finally grab hold of me and my very stubborn to get attention sometimes, and is now laid claim to my life in a way that I that no matter how hard I might try, I could not ever wiggle out of or rationalize my way out of. And so the Lord has just been just infinitely faithful to me and has been steadfast in his love for me, even when for large parts of my life I didn't really have any love for him, didn't walk, wasn't walking with the Lord. It was about as rotten as I could get, but still he never gave up on me and you now he, he delivered me from this from this affliction and and it was it's wonderful and incredible to to be able to go back and share. Brandon's story is is a pretty radical story and he'll tell you all about it how he had this this sickness that came upon him and was seen to be getting worse and worse and until that one night we just began to pray for everybody in the room to be healed all at once and and he felt the the pain just move and shift in a, in a strange way and Jaron and myself began to pray for him right up here right up in that that place where we're sitting, standing right now and uh, we're, as we're praying for him, the, the pain begins to go away, but it begins to focus weirdly on how he described it in this one place on his, on his ankle. And as we're praying, the Bible talks about visions. And I've never had anybody explain to me what a vision is, but over time, I've learned that that's one of the spiritual gifts that God gives me, is that I'll have an image in my mind that God gives that I can't mess with. That's the only way I can describe it, is it's like uh, a mental picture, but you can't tweak it. So if I said, think of an elephant, okay? Now put a pink hat on its head. You can do that. Now you got an elephant with a pink hat on its head. It's like an imaginary picture that I can't alter. And I've had this several times. I've known it's from the Lord because there's been circumstances in people's lives that have been totally changed. And this is one of them. While we're praying for him, uh, I saw this uh, like on superimposed over his ankle in my mind's eye, this big, ugly, looked like a, like a dark purple crab crouching on his leg, which was strange to me. And the only thing I could think is, well, that's not something from the Lord. And so we began to, we're praying, and as Jaron was praying at the time, I began to, you know, harsh under my breath, like, get out of here, get, on, get off of him, you know, and praying in Jesus' name. And then in my mind, I see this thing scuttle away, and then that's when Brandon just began to say, okay, I'm feeling better now. It's all, the pain is all gone. 
And the way that I explain that is, the only way I can explain that is, the Bible gives us a couple different examples of how Jesus healed people. Very often, most of the time, Jesus just laid hands on somebody and said, be healed. There are a few instances, though, where it says Jesus spoke of a spirit of affliction. I think of the woman who was bent over in the, in the synagogue, and Jesus said this, daughter of Abraham that Satan has bound. So I don't believe that Brandon was possessed. He's, he, I know he wasn't because I knew him, but he was being harassed by the devil. We know that the Bible says Satan can get a moral foothold in our lives. Paul says, don't give place to the devil. Don't give him a foothold to shake you around. This seems to be a way where the devil grabs hold of a person's body and the way to be delivered from that is through prayer. And that's exactly what we did, that Satan had been attacking and harassing Brandon, but it was time for him to be set free. And that is exactly what the Lord did during that time. So I don't usually go around thinking of that, but I keep that in my mind, that Satan attacks people and afflicts their bodies, like with the story of Job in the Bible. And sometimes sickness just happens and we pray. Sometimes we need to remember that this is combat. This is war between us and the devil. And the Lord is desiring to set his people free because we have the power of Christ and there's nothing that can stop us. Well, hey y'all, my name's Daniel. And I'm Sharon. And we came to Calvary Chapel here in Trustville about 10 months ago. We moved to Alabama, came right to this church and have loved it. When we came, they were doing the Ironworks Conference and this conference was about the Holy Spirit. So the problem I was having with my ears is that every little sound would really, really be too much. Like even the smallest sounds would cause me pain. Um, I had to put like earplugs in just to be in regular conversation or um, when I heard especially screaming or loud sounds from my kids who weren't necessarily being bad, it was just too much for me to handle. The pain became increasingly more intense. I felt prompted by God to go up and ask for prayer and I had actually heard in the worship song that he heals because he loves. And I had a lot of confidence that God loved me and that he would or could heal me. And so I went and asked for prayer. And I talked to Catelyn and she um, got Pastor Tyler to pray for me after the service was over. And when he prayed for me, um, I felt immediate like healing in um, this ear. But then I didn't quite feel it in this ear, um, and I told him that, and do you remember what he said? Uh, he actually confirmed that. He's like, when I was praying for you, I felt like uh, you're having more problems with your right ear, which is one of those really cool moments. You're like, man, God is like talking and working in this moment, and I remember how shy she was to say that, because of course you pray, and you... I thought it was really cool, Pastor Tyler was like, how do you feel now? Because I love that. He's like, why not see, like, did God actually heal you? And I saw the awkwardness in her face. It was like, well, she wants to say yes. It's like, this ear, yes. But this one, I'm still not feeling it. Um, and he confirmed, like, you know, I felt like that same thing was happening. Like, your right ear needs more prayer. And at that point, he's like, so let's keep praying. And so we laid our hands on her again and just prayed for her right ear again. Yeah, and so I felt a little bit of relief. But um, back in August, which was about three months later, I started having that problem again, except for this time I started to kind of be more aware of what was actually going on. And it sounds really, really weird, but I could feel um, my eyes move. I could hear my eyes move inside my head. And just the intensity of the pain um, was becoming so, so great. Being a stay-at-home mom with four kids, and they're so loud, <laughs> and my, it was just really hard to tolerate, and I was just having a really difficult time, and I was embarrassed to ask for more prayer because it was something similar, um, but just in that one particular ear that had been more difficult, and but I did. It was really hard to humble myself, but um, I did. I asked him for prayer again, and so... Again, I was encouraged by a worship song the night that he was going to pray for me. This one was from This is the Kingdom song um, by Pat Barrett. And it says, ask and you will receive and it will be done. And so I, I asked again and um, he prayed. And this time I felt air coming through my ear as he prayed. And I haven't had that problem again. And so that's wonderful. And then I have one other really great 
thing that just happened, um, I do remember this very in detail because this was just five weeks ago. I was having migraines for two weeks every day, every day, just so bad that I was crying out in pain. And I had texted the children's ministry um, saying, I can't do it anymore for right now because I'm in too much pain. Right after that, though, I I asked for prayer because I know that God answers prayer. I'm starting to become more and more confident in his healing and his love for me. And so um, they prayed after church, not in front of anyone. Um, Catelyn and Pastor Tyler came and they anointed me with oil and prayed. And I haven't had a migraine since like for five weeks. And I'm just really thankful to God and his love for me. And I think the thing that I learned the most was just how much he loves us. And um, also, you don't have to think you can only be healed one time. Like God is okay with us asking more than once. And it's okay um, if it doesn't happen always the same way for every single person. Don't be afraid to ask because he loves you and he will heal you. He will if you ask. Amen. I've mentioned that certain times when we're healed by the Lord, we have an encounter with God, that there can be physical manifestations that come along with it. We see this in the Bible. There are even people that would fall down in the presence of the Lord. We see this during times of revival where people talk about heat or they talk about, it felt like I was struck by lightning. And it's hard to tell what's legitimate and what's not unless you're right in front of it. And the things that Sharon experienced were absolutely legitimate. She was having some issues with her ears, as she's explained, and when she wanted us to pray for her the first time at, the, at their conference, I believe, we laid hands on her and prayed for her, and she said it felt like air rushed out of her ears, which I thought was pretty amazing. That wasn't something I'd experienced before, and there was another time she came up to me and said, Tyler, this, this affliction is seeming to come back, and I need prayer again. Now, here's something I want to bring up before I tell the rest of the story. Many times when we are healed of something, if the issue comes back, people can feel very, very guilty, like they did something wrong. If, if it wasn't for me, this never would have happened again. My only thing that I say is, if God healed you once, come back and ask again. I'm going to use an illustration from something Jesus said, just don't get it confused here. Jesus said when a demon is cast out, it wanders around until eventually it comes back to find the place where it was cast out. So I don't believe that this was somebody who was possessed, certainly. But what it tells us is something about the behavior of the devil when he's afflicting somebody is that he'll try to come back and do it again. And what needs to be happened is to come back and say, no, in Jesus' name, this is what God has already said. So don't feel guilty about that. And if you find things starting to recur, just bring it back to Jesus again. That's what Sharon did. She sent me an email, I believe it was, and she said, Tyler, we're going to need to pray for this again. I said, all right, after church tonight, we'll lay hands on you and pray for you again. It was during that worship service where she said she felt that rush of air was blow over her face while we were singing and, and was healed in the moment. She said, well, I guess you don't really need to pray for me now. We still did because it's always good to pray. But the other time, we just went out to her car and laid hands on her and poured oil on her and, and anointed her in Jesus' name and said, be healed. And that's exactly what happened. It's an example of a, someone who has been healed and has continued to come back that that is her first resort. And there's even a passage, if we really want to be careful here, where the Lord rebuked King Asa because he sought the physicians rather than the healing of the Lord. Doctors are good things. It's not a bad thing to seek a doctor, but why not let Jesus be your first resort? Or at least alongside those other things, because God is more powerful than any doctor. So my health journey started when in elementary school. I guess before that, um, I had asthma and that caused a lot of problems and um, dealt with that all through elementary school. And then get into middle school, into sixth grade, um, started having more health issues. Come to find out that I had had acid reflux my whole life. Um, asthma and acid reflux go hand in hand. Um, and I was a cougher, not a wheezer, so doctors didn't think I had asthma because a lot of doctors didn't believe in that at the time. So one, that was already hard. Um, and then two, then when the reflux came around, um, the asthma medicines helped if we got the asthma under control, that's why the reflex didn't pop up. And in sixth grade, growing up in puberty, all that, 
it switched. So the asthma medicine no longer helped control. We had to control the reflex. So then it wouldn't aggravate the asthma. Because then if you didn't get the first one under control, the second one started. And then I couldn't breathe. Um, we found out one night I was cooking in the kitchen with my grandfather and we were betting who could make the hottest in gelato sauce and ended up in the ER um, about probably an hour after eating dinner because um, I was getting sick and my mom was like, are you okay? Are you okay? And I kept putting my hand up and she realized I wasn't being able to breathe. So unfortunately, that's how we found out rushing to the ER that I had reflex and I had asthma. Um, I did not realize at the time until eighth grade that it was GERDs, which is a very severe form of asthma, which wasn't shocking at all. But roll around to eighth grade, the week before spring break, I complained, mom, I am just so tired. I don't know how to explain it. I am exhausted. Like sleeping isn't helping. Um, so from that week to the end of the school year, I missed. I, I mean, I would, I physically couldn't handle going to school and getting up in the morning. It would take all of my energy. I was just so tired. And then that week I started getting sick even more of throwing up and the asthma, nothing could really, was able to control it. Um, we were going to a specialty doctor and they ended up doing a, um, colonoscopy and an endoscopy in the same day um and that's when we really found out it was GERDs and then realized there was other things didn't know what they were there were possibility of IBS IBD colitis Crohn's um the doctor had put me on a medicine to help with all that um but we knew that wasn't that was another thing going on, but there was still more. Um, long story short, I won't get into it, but I ended up being healed of that situation. Came home from camp, told my parents, I stopped taking my medicine, I got healed from that. And my parents freaked out, <laughs> took me to the doctor, and he was like, oh yeah, I don't see signs of it anymore, she's fine, she doesn't have to take the medicine anymore. And my parents were like, okay, so we just wasted a couple hundred dollars on medicine, but... I don't have the issue anymore, so they were grateful. Every even grade year, I would get sick in school, not fully understanding what was happening. You know, we knew it was GERD, we knew it was asthma to an extent. Come to 10th grade, um, we had moved to a different town, um, and my episodes were getting worse. They would be consistent of I would feel something in the back of my throat and it would build up and um, I would start coughing and gagging and just get sick and then get like a headache from it sometimes and it was just, it was not fun <laughs> and it would just zap me of all my energy. So come um, by 10th grade, we were in a whole different city going to it all went recommended to a specialist and um a ears throat ears throat and nose doctor and he looked at me and he's like what do you do for at school like what activities are you involved in I said well I'm involved in cheerleading and choir and he's like are you just a natural talkative person and I said yeah <laughs> <laughs> and he was like you've got it's like five syllables long I can barely pronounce it well I'm probably gonna butcher it Lara Jen Lara phenotical, it's, it, it's, it's a mouthful. But essentially, it has symptoms similar to GERDs. So we discovered that in 10th grade, and that helped, but we knew that wasn't, there was still more to it. No one could pinpoint where the fatigue was coming from. Mm -hmm. um, by 12th grade... I had another endoscopy done, and the doctor basically looked at me and was like, well, there's nothing we can do for you. You're going to live with this the rest of your life. Okay, great. already knew that. <laughs> it didn't need another, you know, on, because there was hopes of surgery of helping. 
now that I was an adult, I was 18. Fast forward a few months after high school, um, my family doctor, we were dealing with issues and he was like, did you ever get blood tested? No. In eighth grade, no. Come to find out why I had gotten so sick in eighth grade, I had gotten mono. But mono had brought other issues to light. And so then it turned into, it was either mono or Epstein-Barr, and then it turned into a chronic mono. So then every few years on the spot, and when it got into like the winter time, it would act up. Um, and that was the cause for the fatigue. And so then, you know, everything combined, it was just like a domino effect. If you acted one up, you acted them all up. Then fast forward a few years later, um, on and off, I'd been dealing with migraines my whole life, but they ended up getting worse. I ended up getting gluten intolerance. Uh, by that we, that time, we were already together. We were married when I found out about the gluten intolerance. Fast forward, we ended up down here. And um, I was having to miss a lot because I was just tired. You just really didn't feel good at all. Yeah, I didn't feel good at all. Things were just, they were slightly getting worse, but there was really nothing you could do do about it just watching my trying to watch my diet I didn't feel as tired if I ate you know gluten but but you know didn't care anything um it was what within our first year or so it was at a prayer night um the sanctuary in the new built in the sanctuary over here I think it was our first prayer week it was actually in this side oh, the, old, this the side? old side yeah I didn't remember. see I was able it to was be there the, uh, not last year but the year before yeah. So um, she had had to miss a lot that week. She couldn't come to the prayer service because uh because of the uh, episodes she just cough and she would just get so tired from all that stuff she would feel fatigued. She just couldn't come. It just was hard on her. And uh, we had several friends that week who um, just kept her in prayer that whole time. Stephanie, was Stephanie the first Christensen, one. and Brandon, and my brother, and. All of them were just like always praying for that week. And we brought her up and prayed for him. Then uh, I think it was the third night in, Brandon said, hey, we should just come over to your house and pray for your am Amber. Just, you know, like pray that the Lord would heal her. Because that's really what we are trying to do that week was just bring our requests before the Lord and let the Lord take care of them. So they're like, okay, that sounds good. I guess I hate to say it, but at that point, both of us, we had grown so, because she dealt with it for so many years, we like almost grown yeah. numb to it. Like, well, it's like we knew healing could happen, but I'd come to the terms of, all right, well, this is part yeah. of my testimony. It's just going to be with us for the rest of our lives. And not that we couldn't believe the Lord couldn't heal it, but it took somebody out on the outside saying, hey, let's just come in and pray for it. Let's just bring it for the Lord. So Brandon came over and uh, Stephanie and a couple of others and just came There's over. About 13 people yeah, or like so. That. Um, the funny part is no one meant for, we forgot to mention to Tyler and Kat, this was all happening. Everyone just kind of came over. Yeah. Uh, it was a Thursday night. Yep. Um, Jer Jaren came home on a Wednesday because that Friday we were supposed to have a bonfire at the house. And Jaren came home Thursday and was like, hey, like, because of the weather, the bonfire got canceled, but we're still having people over. And I was <laughs> like, sure. And he's like, they want to come over and pray and heal you. And I was like. Would love it. If it happens, it happens, you know. Yeah, they came over that night and they just first thing they did is just walked in the room and said, All right, tell us briefly what's you know, what you've been dealing with because some of them didn't know the full story. And literally we just all sat in a circle, put her in the middle and just laid hands on her and prayed. And they asked what was bothering me in that moment. And it just it literally was I think it was like maybe twenty minutes of of us just sitting there praying before the Lord. And, you know, throughout that 20 minutes, the Lord just started working on things. At one point, Jason brought up, um, hey, is there like heart issues that's maybe getting in the way of why the this is a spiritual warfare? Maybe this is why things are hard for her. And she had just recently gotten through a bout with losing a friendship that meant a lot to her. And through that, Jason praying for that, she was able to let that go. And... Literally right after that is when you started to feel changes. Oh, yeah. It was before that, too. I forget who prayed for it. But the fatigue went away first. 
Um, it just felt like it was just pulled straight out of just straight out of my body. And then I don't remember if Jason praying for for the matters of the heart was before or after getting this sick. But they prayed for because I was feeling the stuff in the throat. And they asked for that to be gone. And I physically got sick. And I had to go to the bathroom with Jaren and just have an episode. And when I came back, I no longer felt the mucus sitting back there anymore. And we just knew that was like, that was the last time I was ever going to have an episode. And it was. <laughs> yeah, I know it was. It's been about, was it two years now, I guess, a little more? And she hasn't had an episode like that since. The fatigue is gone. The coughing, the gagging, all that stuff is just gone. Yeah, both reflexes are gone. The asthma is gone. Um, the gl gluten intolerance is gone. The used, migraines. used to be you couldn't even sing out loud like because it would just cause you to irritate your throat. But <laughs> after the prayer session we had, we were just... Everyone was so happy with how it turned out that we all went out to eat. And we started <laughs> blasting her favorite band, Hawk Nelson. She just started singing to the top of her lungs. And it didn't affect her like she could sing. Like it, she didn't get like any episodes coughing. Like it was just done. And they went and ate spicy food because that was also the thing I couldn't enjoy. And I love Mexican. Like, like I said before, that's how I got in sick. And so they were all like, push it, eat the spiciest food you can possible. And I was like, I'm going to. And I did, and I'm there on the way back. I was singing and didn't, you know, and I was talking, and the whole time I didn't get sick. I didn't have an episode, mm -hmm. and I haven't had one since. I relate my story to the story in the Bible where the friends were so desperate to get their friend to Jesus that they lowered him through the roof. Yes, I had faith that it could happen, but my friend's faith was greater. You know, it's not that I didn't want to ask for it, but they were like, you are asking, we are asking for it for you, you know, and they lowered me down. Mm -hmm. um, if it wasn't for their push and for them coming over. I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened eventually, but it, that night it happened because, because of their faith. We have so. a good family down here that, we pray for each other, and it was a, just an encouragement because, like I said before, when you have something, you deal with something for so long, it can be easy just to put it in autopilot and just deal with it when it comes and just think it's a normal part of life. But you have friends down here, a family, who say, no, the Lord can heal this. Let's bring it for the Lord. And certainly he did. That He healed her that night, and she's honestly had a way better quality of life since then. I couldn't ask for anything better for her. Yeah. It was hard on him, you know. He didn't always understand. I could be fine one minute, and the next minute I would be over the toilet and be like, I can't go, I can't do plans, like I'm sick. And he'd be like, Okay, what the crap just happened? Like, he, it's hard. It was, it was hard. It was taking a toll on our r relationship because you know, we wanted to go think, do and go do things and spend time together, and it, it wasn't allowed, it was, it was coming an obstacle. It was hindering us and our relate, you know, and doing things for the Lord too was causing spiritual warfare. There's be times, you know, wanting to go to church and you know, can't just you know, you know, and then trying to make sure that I had enough energy for work and, um, you know, it was just it was a toll. Or I can't do it this can't do that this weekend because I got to make sure you know, be prepared for something else. So I had to miss out a lot on life. And I don't have to anymore. The Lord brought life back. Yeah, yeah. I so like that. probably for me, he's at least incre increased my faith that even the smallest of things, what seem like can seem small to somebody, like acid reflux or whatever it is in your life, or big things, I should say, like God doesn't overlook those things. And I've had to learn it. Sometimes it can be easy to think, well, that's just part of life. God sees this part of life. He's doesn't. He's just moving on and doing other things. Yeah. He sees those things, and he wants to touch those things and heal those things. So whatever is in your life that's bothering you health-wise, don't be afraid to take it to the Lord. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> 
I love the story of Amber being healed, not just because I've known her my entire life, that's not, not an exaggeration, but I wasn't there. And I love that I wasn't there because you can get this idea, especially on matters of the Holy Spirit like this, that, oh, Pastor Tyler is the one who has the, the voice of God, and so we need to make sure that he's there and don't do anything without the man of God. That's simply not the case. Yeah, it's okay to come to your pastor and the elders have a job to teach and to pray, but the Bible tells us that we can admonish one another, we can rebuke each other, we can lead other people to Christ, that there's really not a, a limit in the Bible on who baptizes, so why, about, why not about healing? That they just went over and in faith prayed for this woman and she was healed. I love hearing things like that because my job is not to do all the ministry. Ephesians 4 says it is my job to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And that's exactly an example of what went on. And I'm hoping that you'll do the same thing, that you'll walk away from this, not thinking I gotta go find a good pastor to pray for me, but that you will just start talking to Jesus yourself and, in, and asking the Holy Spirit to intervene on your behalf because he will. I myself have never personally been healed by the Lord, but I have been used, gratefully, many times to pray for people and see them be healed. And the greatest and coolest story I could tell was this night I was doing ministry in Peru. We were down there, I was down there at the Bible College, Calvary Bible Institute there, and one night I went out to, uh, lead, to preach and then to lead a prayer meeting at one of the church plants they had in, in a rough area, a rough part of town down there, and just the nicest, kindest brothers and sisters in Christ. And we began just by praying, waiting upon the Lord, words of encouragement, allowing for the spiritual gifts to be exercised, and then as we come to the end of the, the night, really, we were coming to the end of our time, and I said, is there anybody here that, that needs healing? And we talked a little bit about healing, some of the things I've already mentioned here. And, and uh, would you like to be healed? And a lot of people raised their hand. I said, it's okay, so let, let's pray for them. And my friends, we saw 14 people healed that night in a span of about one hour. And I did not do anything different than I had ever done before. I didn't have any special you know, trembling that was happening in my hands. I didn't have any new fresh ideas. It was just walking around, laying hands on people and praying for them. I will say that you could tell the Holy Spirit was there in that moment. It was very heavy in the room, that, that presence at the time. But we hadn't done anything different to gin it up. The Lord was just there. And I, I could tell you every one of these stories, but let me just tell you a few. One of which was there was a woman whose neck was hurting her and she, she couldn't bend it down all the way or bend it all the way up and she was having trouble with the pain and you know we go and lay hands on her and praying for her and when I said in Jesus' name, amen, she startled under my, my hand as she started breaking down crying and I speak a little Spanish, but not this fast. And she started explaining what was going on and she kept on you know, talking, da 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 And what she was saying was, I was, you listening and praying, and then when you said amen, I felt all the vertebrae in my neck just snap right back into place. And she felt it click, and then she was moving her neck and doing all this, and everybody started just to cry and worship and praise the Lord, and so then everybody else was raising their hands. And uh, there was one young man who had this, this weakness. We think it might have been some kind of anemia. It was a very poor area, so a lot of this was undiagnosed, but um, they, they kept on pointing to him, go pray for him, and uh, he was shaking my hand and he could barely really squeeze it. And they said, would you please, please pray for him? And so we did and that God would strengthen him. And, and um, he reaches out after we finish and grabs my hand and he's squeezing it hard. And you know, to me, it's like, oh, that's kind of what a handshake feels like. But the whole room just, <gasps> just gasped because they knew what this, this young man, probably 14, 15, had dealt with before and they, they couldn't believe this. So I began going around and we, all these people that wanted prayer. And a couple times we laid hands on somebody and uh, when I touched one woman, uh, on her back, she pulled back like that when I laid hands on her, she began to cry right away. And we said, what is it, what's happened? And she said, when you touched me, it was like somebody took a knife, stuck it in me and pulled it out all at once, just ch -ch -ch, just like that. And she said, all the pain in my kidneys, which what we were praying for, was gone. And she was sitting there trying to like punch her back, trying to like make the pain come back. And I didn't feel anything different. I just laid hands on her and, and she noticed that. There was somebody else we laid for, hands on her for, I think she had headaches of migraines or something like that. And same thing, I put my hand on the back of her head and she said she felt like somebody stabbed a dagger in the back of her head and pulled it out and all the pain was gone. And I've experienced this other times too where I'd lay hands on somebody to pray and they say, you know, your, 
your hands, they feel like they're, they're hot, like they're burning into my skin and it doesn't feel any different to me. But the Lord is working. The Lord is moving. I've learned that when certain things like that start to take place, then we should continue to persist in prayer because that means that the Lord is, is in that moment. There was a man who had a, a uh, racing heart. He had me put his hand on his heart and it was just like beating super fast. And again, very poor. They, they, nothing they could do. And I, I promise you, as I'm laying hands on this man with my hand on his chest, I felt his heart just get, kind of go, dun, 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 dun. And he starts crying and his wife start crying. There was this old woman there who had, uh, I believe it was breast cancer. And we laid hands on her, prayed for her. And while we're praying for her, she just wailed in the middle of it. Ooh! And I'm like, you know, are you okay, Grandma? Are you okay? And, and she was holding herself like this. And she said, all the pain is gone and I can't feel the tumors anymore. And it, it was just like this one right after the other. And Again, I wasn't doing anything there. I wasn't praying stronger or anything. I just, I'm usually pretty mellow when I pray. Just, Lord, in Jesus' name, please heal this person. And, and the other pastor was there praying with me as well. And we go around the circle, people's heads, people's backs. Uh, there's one woman who had ovarian cysts that we prayed for, which that's going to take a doctor's diagnosis. But everybody in that room said, no, we believe she's been healed. Because if God can heal all these other people, he can certainly heal her. And that's one of those things you walk away from. And I can't take a lick of credit for any of that. Neither can Pastor on Hell or any of the guys that were there because we were just praying like we always do, but the Lord was there that night. We had invited the Lord into that place and said, tonight, we're going to take God at his word. We're going to lay hands on people and pray for them the way Jesus taught us to, and God answered those prayers. And I've had nights like that of ministry in other ways before. People have gotten saved or people have been filled with the Holy Spirit or, or repented of sin, but that, that was a special time. And I just know that that's just the beginning. That as we have faith in the Lord, we're going to see more of those things happen. Not just at a place in Peru, but all around the United States and all around the world where the Lord is going to break in and show his power and his authority to a bunch of hurt and broken people so that they'll have faith not just for their bodies to be healed, but for their souls to be saved. These stories are pretty amazing. And I hope they've been as exciting for you as they were for us to experience them. But I said earlier on that most people will sit on their testimonies when they've been healed. And one thing I want to leave you with today is not to sit on what God has done for you. If you've listened to this and it's given you even a little bit of encouragement to say, okay, this doesn't seem too strange. It's just talking to God. Maybe he can help me or maybe he can help my friend or my daughter or my son or my whatever it might be. Because that's what testimonies are supposed to do. They're supposed to build faith. You're supposed to take the things God has done for you, tell the world so that they now have faith in Christ. They now know that God loves them enough to not only be able to touch their soul, but even to touch their bodies. That Romans 8, it says, if God has already given us his son, will he not freely give us all other things, all these other lesser things? We're supposed to be people that believe and that pray, pray, and keep on praying. Jesus told us a parable. It says that we should always pray and never lose heart. John 14, it says that if you believe in Christ, Jesus said, you will do the same works he did and even greater works than those. And that wasn't talking about having more people come to your church than Jesus did. Read the book of John. That's all talking about the miraculous works and signs that Jesus did. He said, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, hold on. Some people read that verse and they say, see, that the Father may be glorified. So the only things you ever pray for is find out those things that will glorify God and exclusively and only pray for those. Of course, that's a good lesson to learn, but that's not the point of that verse. The point of the verse is that when you ask in Jesus' name and the Father answers, that is what will glorify the Father in the Son. God is glorified by answering your prayers, which is why in the following verse, Jesus says it without the qualifier. He says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is all a call to prayer, a call to prayer to believe that when the Bible talks about healing, it's not just a metaphor for God helping you work through struggles. Those things happen, and we could tell more stories about how those things happen at the same time, that something internal was handled by dealing with something external or vice versa. But this is all to teach you to come to Jesus, come to the throne of grace, and pray and ask the Lord for healing. I'm not special. I have no power. Jesus has all the power. And Jesus is sovereign and victorious over the curse and the thorns and over sickness. And he wants to help you and intervene in your life. If you'll call upon his name, believe by faith that what he did on the cross and the empty tomb was enough, and say, now, Lord, we need your help for this sentence right here. Don't you think Jesus loves to heal people? He spent an awful lot of time doing it while he was alive. How much more now that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, still interceding for us. God is a healing God. Let's not ever forget that.